കരുണാർണവമായി കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം ഈദ Namaste. So today we're almost done with this series. We're going to talk about the six types of samadhi discussed in Trigdrishya Viveka. Text 28. Akhang nao karasang vastu satchidananda lakshanam ityā vachin na chinteyam samādhir madhyamo bhavet. The entity which is always of the same nature, unlimited by time, space, etc., and which is characterized by existence, consciousness, bliss, is verily Brahman. Such uninterrupted reflection is called the intermediate absorption, that is, savikalpa samadhi associated with sound object. Text 29. സ്താബ്ധീഭാവെ രസാസ്വാദീയ പൂർവൻമത്തിഭിഷാദ്ഭിർത്വാലംതരം ദി ഇൻസെൻസിബിലിറ്റി ഓഫ് ദ മൈൻഡ് ടു എക്സ്റ്റേണൽ ഓബ്ജക്ട്സ് ആസ് ബിഫോർ ഓൺ അക്കൗണ്ട് ഓഫ് ദി എക്സ്പീരിയൻസ് ഓഫ് ബ്ലിസ് ഇസ് ഡെസിഗ്നേറ്റഡ് ആസ് ദ തേർഡ് കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് നിർവികൽപ സമാധി The practitioner should uninterruptedly spend his time in these six kinds of samadhi. So over the last six or seven verses, six kinds of samadhi have been presented. And this is the practice that corresponds to the philosophy given in the beginning of the book. The distinction between the seer and the seen. Drig. Drishya Vivekaha. So how do we put this into practice? Well, there are six ways, and we'll show this chart here. The two divisions between the different kinds of samadhis are objective and subjective. In objective samadhi, one focuses the attention on something outside oneself, and in the subjective samadhi, the focus is the self so here you see the different kinds of samadhi the six different kinds and the shlokas that describe them and you can refer to the uh, notes and commentary the edited commentary which i'm going to upload tomorrow and will be in the video description for the details You should also look in the video description below for the commentary on these two verses. But I want to talk more about personal experience. My personal experience practicing the uh, views given in this book has been just tremendous, just wonderful. And this is something I want to share with everyone because You know, for a long time I have been looking for a way of stating the absolute that is doctrinally neutral. In other words, it's not a part of any sectarian line of teaching. And I think in Trig Drishya Vivekaha we see one of the if not if not the most neutral presentation of of dwaita uh it's one of them for sure now i'm not pretending to be <laughs> a, a scholar of dwaita i'm fairly new to the dwaita teaching i've only been studying and practicing it well only has been studying it formally for like three years and you know that's nothing compared to the 20 plus years that i had put into uh Vaishnavism or the seven plus years that I put into studying Buddha's teaching. But for me, it's adequate. And the reason I say that is I'm able to get the results. I'm able to perform 
all six types of samadhi given in this book anytime with great, well, not great ease, it still requires an effort, but reliably, regularly, consistently able to reach the bhava, the bliss, huh? that is the signature of success in meditation. In other words, <laughs> when you get into advanced meditation, nobody has to tell you you're doing it right. The experience is its own reward, its own indicator of success. When you get the bliss, huh? there's just nothing like it. Because it's something that you control. You are the self. You are Brahman. There is no other explanation for the human experience that is as satisfying and complete as the Advaita philosophy, the true Advaita philosophy. Now, there are a lot of phony Advaita philosophies out there, and part of the reason we do these series is to help people distinguish between the real, authentic uh, Vedic philosophy of Advaita and the various imitations, the various counterfeits, and the various scams, huh? the people using the name Advaita without actually teaching Advaita. And, you know, it, it's very easy to recognize them. They charge a lot of money. Huh? Or they have, like, lots of titles. Shri, 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 hyper, mega, double, super, incredible, Swami to the max. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Every sentient being is nothing but a dueta with some covering. Every sentient being is Brahman. Everything that lives <laughs> or not, moving or non-moving, huh? whether it's in existence or out of existence, is nothing but Brahman. Just like the waves and the ocean. The waves seem to be a separate phenomenon from the ocean, but actually they're nothing but ocean. So this is the nature of the relationship between the sentient beings and Brahman. The sentient beings and other objects present themselves in such a way that they appear separate. But if you investigate deeply into it, you will see that actually there's no boundary between one thing, one object, and another. For example, I mean, take this body. Huh? This body has a covering called skin. And the convention is to say the body ends at the skin. Well, that's not really true. Because there's a constant exchange of air, and water and chemicals and so many things between the body and the surrounding environment. Even a plant is always transpiring water, absorbing carbon dioxide and sunlight and so on. Without the environment, none of us would be able to live for a second. So there really is no difference. There really is no boundaries. Try to get this through your head. The only thing that makes it appear different is name and form. And name and form is maya. It doesn't really exist. That's what maya means. So just because we call this thing a wave and this other thing the ocean doesn't mean they're actually separate. Just because we call this, this body by one name and another body by another name doesn't mean they're different. Because names and forms are always changing, constantly changing. Every time I wiggle my fingers, the body is changing. Every time my heart beats, every time my neurons fire in my brain, the body is changing. It's never the same. 
and on a longer time scale. It started out as a tiny little egg and sperm, and then it gradually grew to a fetus, and then it came out into the world screaming and crying because <laughs> the world is suffering. Confirmed. Then it grew up and became a young rascal, and then it became a young man, and then a middle-aged man. Now it's an old man. Soon it'll dwindle and then disappear. So there's no constancy in this body. That's why it's simply a dream. Huh? At night when we're asleep, we have so many dreams. But what happens to them when we wake up in the morning? Poof, they're gone. And unless we make a special effort, it's hard even to remember them. So the same thing is going to happen to this dream. In fact, it happens every night. We go from the dream, the so-called waking dream, into the dream of sleep. And then we go into deep sleep, and there's no awareness of anything at all. This happens every single night. The whole world, the universe, comes into existence every morning. <laughs> no wonder it's so hard to wake up in the morning. <laughs> And then it goes away again at night. And we're plunged into a whole different world where crazy things are possible that could never happen in so-called reality, <laughs> in Jagrat consciousness. And then again, the whole thing disappears. And we're in nothing. We're in emptiness. We're in sushupta, deep sleep. Now, if we observe this, and we rise above it, we enter a fourth state of consciousness called Turiya. Turiya simply means the fourth, because it's very, very hard to describe. It is the center of all the other states of consciousness, and it is the intermediary state between them. For example, when going from waking to dreaming sleep, when going from dreaming sleep to deep sleep, and the reverse, in those transitions, we are actually in Turiya. And if we observe, I think it's very useful to try to observe the change when going to sleep at night. Because in order to get from waking consciousness to sleep consciousness, we have to go through Turiya. And we can observe this. Or we can observe it first thing in the morning. You know what I do first thing in the morning when I wake up? Usually it's still dark. 3 or 4 a.m. I immediately, I just wash my face, maybe, you know, and then I immediately go and sit on my meditation seat. And I observe, I watch. I am the watcher. I am the witness. I am Brahman. I am pure consciousness. Consciousness without an object. But if I'm not capable of reaching that highest state, nirvikalpa, I can easily reach savikalpa samadhi and become the watcher, the witness, the seer, and simply note all these things that I'm seeing. And if I'm sitting there with my legs crossed and my eyes closed, I'm seeing mostly internal things. So when I see within myself all these things going on, I know this is simply the action of karma. This is simply Maya's play. Huh? This is the play of the mother. And so I can detach from it. And I don't think that this is me. This is who I am. This is myself. Huh? I think, no, this is a play. This is a phenomenon. And it's different from me. I am only the watcher. I am not the doer. I have only being. I don't have any action. So if we cultivate this type of consciousness, then in due course of time, uh, we start to identify as the witness more than as the doer, the thinker, the knower, the haver, uh, <laughs> or any of those other roles. And, and this is really the best and most direct way to attain complete 
enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.